Great. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Ennis. I'm the communications advisor with Quality of Care NL. So I want to welcome you today to today's session of healthy discussions. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping notes. The uh, chat box and the Q&A Q feature are both open, so please feel free to use them throughout the session. You can turn on subtitles, which are auto-generated by clicking the CC button on the bottom left corner of your screen. And this session is being recorded and will be posted to Quality of Care NL's YouTube channel. I'd like to acknowledge that we are joining you from the ancestral territory of the Beothic and the lands on which Memorial University's campuses are situated are in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups. We acknowledge with respect the histories and cultures of the Beothic, the Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of this province. We invite everyone to offer land or territorial acknowledgements in the chat and to take a moment to reflect not only on why we offer these acknowledgements, but also ways that your life and work may contribute to decolonization and reconciliation. For those who aren't familiar with Quality of Care NL, we are a research and evaluation program based at Memorial University aimed at improving social and health outcomes in our province. Healthy Discussions is a webinar series where we have quality conversations about health, health care, and social systems in Newfoundland and Labrador. Our goal is to engage with you on these topics with the aim of continuing public conversations during the ongoing process of health transformation in our province. Public discussions also contribute to the growth of a learning health and social system in Newfoundland and Labrador. On the screen right now, you can see a definition of a learning health and social system as defined by Health Accord NL in its task force report. This definition might seem a little bit complicated the first time you read it, but what it really boils down to is a health and social system that continuously improves through a culture of best practice, evaluation, equity, openness, and collaboration. The system learns and gets better, resulting in better health uh, care and better health for all. Part of the definition states that individuals and families are active participants in all elements. By engaging in sessions like this one and by being an active participant in your own health care and wellness, by talking about and acting on social issues that impact us as a society, you are contributing to a learning health and social system in our province. So today our discussion is going to focus on family care teams and we are really delighted to have joining us from the Department of Health and Community Services, Monica Bull, who is Senior Manager of Primary Health Care, Bernadette doyle Follett, who is Collaborative Primary Health Care Teams Consultant, and from Newfoundland and Labrador Health Services, we have Erica Parsons, who's Director of Primary Health Care Chronic D Disease Prevention and Management in the Western Zone, and Erin Bala, Interim Director of Primary Health Care and Community Support Program in the Eastern Urban Zone. So we welcome everybody um, here today and we're excited for this conversation. Joining them for today's discussion is one of Quality of Care NL's Health Policy Analyst, Cheryl Echigari. Cheryl has some questions to get our conversation started, but we will be taking questions from the audience. So please type your questions in the Q&A box, which is a little easier for us to manage, but the chat box also works. Um, so since today's discussion is being recorded, you may wish to ask your question anonymously, which you can do by using the Q&A instead of the chat. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Cheryl, who's going to get us started on um, um, with our first questions. Thank you, Melissa. Um, and thank you uh, everybody for being here today. Um, most of the work that I'm doing, all of the work that I'm doing right now with quality of care and L is focused on family care teams. Uh, so I'm really glad to be here uh, with you today. Um, maybe to get things started, we could talk a bit about what are, what are we talking about when we say family care teams? Monica, what are family care teams? Thanks, Cheryl. Uh, from a health policy perspective, so in, in government, we're, you know, our business is in, in health policy and setting provincial directions. So for us, family care teams are one of the priority calls to action of Health Accord Newfoundland and Labrador. And family care teams are an innovative approach 
to reimagine and redesign the health system in Newfoundland and Labrador. These teams aim to improve access and continuity of primary health care for individuals and families in their communities. And they represent a significant shift from solo-based community practice and program models of program-based models of service delivery to an interdisciplinary team-based model, which provides access to multiple healthcare professionals focused on meeting health and social needs of individuals and families. The family care team's model also provides a framework to reorganize, integrate, and expand upon existing community-based health services and strengths that we already have in our various communities throughout Newfoundland and Labrador. Importantly, these teams aim to respond to dynamic and diverse needs of the local population in which they serve and are an innovative solution to addressing challenges. And those needs and challenges uh, would be very different depending on where you're located within the province. Some of the challenges that we've been experiencing, which we hope family care teams will help alleviate, are of recruitment and retention of healthcare providers, limited access and continuity of care for individuals and their families, efficient use of fiscal resources and system sustainability, and addressing the factors that influence the social determinants of health. Family care teams will be enabled and strengthened by interprofessional teams working collaboratively with individuals and families and their communities to focus on all as aspects of health and wellness. Community engagement will be a critical part of designing and continuously improving these teams. So on a family care team itself, we would typically find providers including family physicians, nurse practitioners, registered nurses, licensed practical nurses, social workers, navigator roles, and other professionals based on community and patient need. So for example, in a particular area, there may be uh, indication that uh, mental health and addictions is a very key priority for that area and we would need to make sure the team is resourced according to those needs. So as I mentioned at the beginning, um, from a policy perspective, um, family care teams is our response to the health accord uh, call to action. And we've actually developed a policy framework for family care teams. And we're gonna post the link in the chat to that framework. So if anyone here online is interested in learning more specific details than what we're covering here, you can have a look at that policy framework. Thank you, Monica. Um, and I'll just add to that, um, we, we can also add a link to the Family Care Teams Resource Hub, which has um, a webinar that sort of uh, distilled some of the key points from the policy framework that might be helpful for people as well if they were interested in um, in listening as opposed to uh, reading through the document. So maybe we could put that up there as well, Melissa. Um, you touched on this already, Monica, uh, but can you elaborate a bit on what are some of the benefits of family care teams for, for both patients and providers? So while we're still early days, and, and we'll talk a bit more about how the teams have developed and, and where they're located, while we're still early days, we anticipate that there will be multiple benefits to both providers, healthcare providers, and patients and families. So first of all, uh, for patients themselves, um, the family care team model will give improved access to an array of multidisciplinary services and supports at the local level. So we, we probably haven't seen that at the local level, you know, there may be allied health professionals typically located in more centralized locations, uh, but the family care teams model will bring those resources to the local uh, communities, be it, uh, for example, dietitian services is an example of that. And we would expect that care will be more comprehensive and coordinated against amongst providers rather. Navigation and the coordination of care across the entire healthcare system will be improved, especially at transition points. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is if you're going from a community care and you, you have to go into 
hospital for some reason, uh, or you need specialist care referral. So we expect that that coordination and any transition between hospital and going back home to community will be improved. We also expect that the need for going to emergency departments to access primary care should decrease with the availability of improved access in the community. So that's, that's for patients themselves. We also expect benefits for providers and those key ben benefits include sharing patient care responsibilities amongst the team, opportunities to work to one's full professional scope of practice and collaboratively through joint team building and quality of care initiatives. Practicing in a team can also improve professional growth, satisfaction and well-being inherent in the working together and learning from each other. And every team will be unique, but there will be um, opportunities for team members to form connections with others in a variety of formal ways, such as team huddles and informal ways as part of uh, working together in a team. We also hope that uh, the family care team's model will aid in the recruitment and retention of healthcare providers. Because what we've learned and, and what we know, especially uh, you know, from speaking to new graduates, be it family physicians, nurse practitioners and others, is that people are more attracted to working in a team than having to go out and work in a solo based uh, practice. So um, we hope that this model will attract you know, attract the new um, new graduates that are coming out. So those are some of the benefits. But uh, you know, we will certainly be evaluating family care teams and uh, and seeing what the overall outcomes are. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Monica. Um, I wonder if this may be a good place to stop. Melissa, are there any questions from anyone in the audience at this point before we move on to another? Let me just take a look here now. Um, just a reminder to everybody that they can um, type questions in the chat or the Q&A throughout. Um, one question here in the chat. Um, is this a made in NL model or does it duplicate family care teams or models from other jurisdictions? That's an excellent question. Monica, you gonna take that one? So I, I will say that through the Health Accord um, work, and Cheryl and I were both part of what was called a community care committee um, that was, you know, prior to us developing a provincial policy framework, uh, we did look at other jurisdictions and models. But our Newfoundland family care teams uh, policy framework is very much tailored to the context of this province. So, for example, you may hear, uh, if you've heard about Ontario, they have family health teams. While it sounds similar, their model is very different than ours. Uh, and, and just a key difference in that model and ours is Newfoundland and Labrador Health Services will have um, operational responsibility for rolling out teams, whereas the family health teams model in Ontario is uh, typically uh, groups of family physicians that come together and form uh, um, a family health team. So it is very much tailored to our current health structure and we'll be building on existing strengths that we already have in our health system. And that's a really important point that I'd like to emphasize is we have a lot of good things happening in primary health care throughout the province and uh, we, you know, whenever we look at establishing a new family care team, it's looking at what's happening in that area, what are the needs, who are the local providers, and how can we build on that and introduce the family care team model. So we're certainly not applying a, uh, a made somewhere else uh, version, but we have considered the evidence from other jurisdictions. In particular, uh, you may have heard of um, the patient medical home model, which is the College of Family Physicians of Canada model. That's one of the um, documents that you'll see referenced in our policy framework, along with the evidence that was uncovered by the Health Accord Community Care Committee's work. Thanks, Monica. Um, okay, so let's let's 
talk a bit about what things might look like practically. Erin, could you give us an example of how the different providers work together to provide care for patients in the family care team model? Sure, yeah, Cheryl. So, as Monica's already alluded to, uh, most of these teams would all be housed under one roof, all under the same infrastructure. So, you'll have a unique ability for the primary care provider, so physician or nurse practitioner, to really be able to engage one on one with individual disciplines, whether that be a dietitian or a mental health and addictions counselor, uh, could be a diabetic nurse educator. And so, the opportunities for conversation and discussion are available. We also have another model titled uh, Hub and Spoke. So that may be an example of a community, a larger community, which might have a, a hub site created where we would have a cluster of interdisciplinary team members as well as primary care providers. And they would uh, provide additional support through outreach to some smaller communities that may exist around them. And even in those circumstances where you might have a primary care provider within a spoke site, they would know that they would have the support of the interdisciplinary team that would be available through the hub, the hub site itself. So a couple of examples of the way in which we see people working together, um, at least in the St. John's urban area. And, and as Monica said, each of these family care teams look a little bit different as to how they're operationalized. But we right now we have morning huddles where we bring together interdisciplinary team members with the primary care providers to have conversations about what patients they might be seeing that day. And if there's an opportunity for any of our team members, like the dietitian, like the physiotherapist, to intervene and have uh, an appointment with one of those patients who's scheduled uh, to see their provider on that day. We could have consultations that happen one on one with a nurse practitioner and a dietitian to speak about some specifics around an individual. We also see group consultations happening where a provider may come in with a list of their elder and frail patient population, and they can have a broader discussion with the entire inter interdisciplinary team on how they would best manage some complex health and social systems. We also have circumstances where we bring everyone together under that same roof if they if they can, where we would have interdisciplinary rounds, talk about new medical guidelines or new evidence that we need to implement based on some changes to the research. And of course, we also see collaborations that happen all throughout the healthcare system. So um, Monica referenced having uh, improvements and transitions in care. So we will see providers that exist within uh, family care teams and their team members making connections to clinicians that are in the acute care setting and facilitating either uh, an admission to hospital, giving some of the baseline information about a, a patient or on the back end, uh, supporting the discharge from hospital and any changes that might have been made to any medications, for instance, while the, the individual was admitted. Oh, that was really helpful, Erin, um, to hear some of those examples about what it, what, how they're actually working together for patient care. That, that was really helpful. Um, so they will, will the family care teams be all across the province? And how many do we have so far? How many have been set up so far? Um, Bernadette, would you like to speak to that? Sure, Cheryl. Um, yes, there will be family care teams throughout the province. Um, the vision for family care teams is to give every person in the province timely access to health and social services and to continuing care centered in the community as part of a well-connected network. In uh, 2022, the Health Accord envisioned 35 teams to blanket the entire province over the next three to five years. And to date, uh, today family care teams are fulfilling that recommendation from Health Accord with 23 teams announced to date. 16 of those are partially or fully operational with seven more underway. And there is planning happening for the 12 remaining uh, teams. Um, four of them were actually announced in the budget this year in 2024. And uh, that work will continue within NL Health Services with a goal for implementation of all within approximately three years, so by 2027. Excellent, thank you, Bernadette. There, there's been there's been a lot of work done um, around family care teams. So that's amazing. Um, Melissa, are there any questions from the audience that we could uh, take right now? 
Yeah, sure. There's lots coming in and I know we have some of our planned questions that are going to address some of them. So, um, I'll just, uh, Bernadette just spoke to, um, the timeline and how far along we are in implementing these family care teams. But, um, 1 of our audience members was wondering if we have a, um, mechanism yet for how we're going to, uh, assess. Um, how effective the family care teams are as they've been implemented. Um, I'll start by responding to that from a uh, government's perspective. Certainly, uh, there will be plans to uh, evaluate family care teams and we already have discussions underway of, of what that will, uh, will look like. And there will be a governance structure, I, I should add as well, um, set up um, around family care teams. So uh, a provincial steering committee and also within uh, Newfoundland Labrador Health Services and maybe Erica or Aaron could speak to this as well, a strategic health network that will be uh, monitoring the implementation, the continuous quality improvement. Uh, so we will, we will, you know, adjust as we need to, as we go along, as we see how things are actually working on the ground. Um, so evaluation will certainly be a key consideration. So just to speak to the strategic health network. So as uh, Monica referenced there, that is housed internal to NL Health Services. And it is an entire portfolio that was created, again, based on recommendations from the Health Accord and to help us realize these recommendations. Uh, right now, they are, are really focused on understanding the literature, supporting the various zones, in applying evidence-based practice to standardized work, and they certainly have an evaluation component that is integrated into the work that they do. I also thought it was important to reference that we have strong partnerships, not only with Quality of Care and L to do some of that evaluation, but also with Memorial University. There are a number of different research partners who are interested in understanding not only the implementation of these teams, but then the effectiveness and how they're able to improve patient outcomes. So we have a, a litany of resources dedicated and interests in evaluating these teams and making sure that we are nimble responding to the needs of the population and that we can demonstrate that there is benefit and value you add for uh, the teams being implemented on the ground. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, Monica. Um, Melissa, would we will take and take another question now if there's another one before we move on? Yeah, sure. sure. Um, Cindy is wondering where oral health will fit in with the family care teams. Um, so I guess if you're thinking about access to a dentist or a dental hygienist, um, are those going to be part of family care teams as well? Who would like to take that question? Bernadette? Um, I was just going to say, and I, I wasn't sure if Aaron was going to jump in, but the teams um, are in early stages and they are developing, um, you know, based on need. And one of the things that um, may be talked about later, but there will be opportunities for um, community practices to affiliate with family care teams. And so um, dentistry may, may be part of that. Um, but I, I don't know if that was exactly the question. If anybody else wants to jump in, Aaron, you can as well. I can probably just speak to the teams as they exist right now. So we don't necessarily have a dentist or dental hygienist that are hired as part of a family care team. However, we certainly recognize that oral health is a critical component to anyone's overall health. And uh, to elaborate on Bernadette's points there, uh, really what we see is uh, an understanding of what is happening in the community, what the gaps are from a, a health perspective. We undergo a bit of thorough community needs assessments and from that information, we're able to craft what um, different partnerships may look like. That's internal to us within NL Health Services, but then also with external partners. So for instance, I could give the example, another uh, tangible one is we, uh, 
uh, may not see the, the need or have the ability actually to even recruit a physiotherapist in a small rural community. However, there may already be a private practice that exists here, similar to the way dentists function. And there could be uh, partnerships and agreements signed on behalf of NL Health Services and those private vendors to deliver the care that's required. So hopefully that answers your question, Cindy. Excellent. Thanks, Erin. Um, so we know we know that the type of care that patients need may differ across the province and access to the care that they need right now may differ, differ across the province. Um, Erica, can you talk to us a bit about what, how teams may look different across the province, thinking about maybe some rural and urban differences? Sure. Um, and I think we've touched on some of these uh, points already, but you know, um, the family care teams, while they will have similar core features, they will not look exactly the same across the province. So each family care team will focus on meeting the needs of the community or the geographic area that they serve. And they'll really take an approach of co-design with local providers and healthcare uh, partners and community residents to ensure that they're taking a needs and strengths based approach to stabilizing the care in that area. So we know that needs and resources are different across communities. So therefore the family care team will need to look different to respond to those needs and the partners will be different. Some of the basic similarities of each family care team will include um, being co-led by a clinic manager and assigned clinical leadership. Patients and families will be connected to a healthcare provider and a team. So there will be a focus on attachment and, and linking uh, directly with a healthcare provider. And care will be coordinated across the team as well as coordinated across the system with other community-based programs and services as was previously alluded to around uh, dental hygiene um, and physiotherapy as an example. And programs and services offered by the family care teams will focus on the patient population that they serve, addressing their unique needs. So that means that they, they may have different team members or offer a variety of different services depending on the needs of that population. We will also uh, see differences in some operational aspects. So it could be different hours of operation, different outreach services, um, you know, in a hub and spoke model, as was previously mentioned, all based on the context of the local community. You may also see walk-in services, after hours clinics, focus on women's wellness clinics. It really will depend on the local needs and um, the, the patient population and the supports that pre that already exist in the community that we can draw on and add value to. Great, thank you, Erica. That was really helpful. Um, okay, so if I was a patient, but if I wanted to join a family care team, um, so I've, I've been accepted into a family care team, as a patient, what can I expect? Um, upon entry into a family care team. Erin, would you like to explain that to us a little bit? Sure, it's actually perfect timing there, Cheryl, because I noticed in the chat there, Sylvia had referenced that she has just become a patient of the clinic and she had to leave to receive her intake appointment. So uh, generally, and, and knowing that, uh, to Erica's point, that a lot of these family care teams have significant similarities, they do have some differences. But generally, right across the teams, what we use, you will see as you're onboarded is that you'll have an initial meet and greet appointment with a primary care provider or a nurse. So uh, in a lot of cases within the urban zone, we do have nurses doing detailed medical and social histories when you first come in, because as actually, as Sylvia referenced, it's been three years now since she's had access to a primary care provider. So that, that's usually the initial touch point for us to get a better understanding of your, uh, your medical status, uh, any complexities around your social history, how we may be able to help or refer you in the right direction around uh, income support, education, food security. So all of those things, the social determinants of health being really critical for us to understand from a health perspective because we know that those are so impactful on our overall health. So I also what's really important to note is that 
On every occasion, you won't always meet with your primary care provider. The idea of having interdisciplinary teams is to really identify what your need may be that day. And it's not necessarily needing to be filled by a physician or a nurse practitioner. It may be more appropriate for you to see a pharmacist to do a thorough review of your medications. And then they, they may go on to make recommendations to the physician or nurse practitioner on medications that might be changed or any adjustments that could happen that could uh, impact your overall health. You may see a social navigator if you have issues related to the social returns of health that need to be addressed, as I referenced around income or access to healthy food, uh, education. Um, you may be seeing a physiotherapist that day because you have a history of chronic pain. Probably important to note that we're really focused on preventative medicine as well. So uh, a key way that we measure our outcomes is recognizing how many of our patients have had the preventative screening measures, whether that may be breast or colorectal cancer, for, for instance. You know, we, will, we will really be focused on uh, questions related to your overall lifestyle and modifiable risk factors. So uh, the amount that you are active or if you have a smoking history and you have interest in, in quitting. Uh, and then also to know we are moving in the direction of offering group programming, which is really exciting for us where we, uh, you know, we've implemented in some of our sites a healthy living series. So people have the opportunity to come in and learn as a group about, uh, you know, how to uh, make some dietary changes to improve your overall health, the importance of activity and what the recommendations would be from a national level. And so all of this information together helps you take more uh, accountability over your health and uh, helps you move in, in a more positive direction. So we can really focus on wellness within the family care teams as opposed to treating illness. And we really want to uh, help people be invested in their overall health themselves, understand their diagnoses, understand their medications, and really understand how they can take control and make steps towards a healthier lifestyle. Thank you, Erin. Uh, that, that's amazing to hear. I know back in the health accord days when, uh, when Monica and I were part of the community care committee um, and we were, we were envisioning um, these teams that are now family care teams, um, wellness and, and prevention was certainly a big piece of that. Um, and it sounds like things are going really well in, in that area. That's wonderful to hear. Um, Melissa, are there any other questions that uh, we could take right now? Yeah, sure. Um, Angie has shared some questions in the Q and A about um, regarding accessibility and inclusivity for patients when they're accessing a family care team. So, a couple of examples that she's giving and is wondering if they're being addressed in the family care team setting. Um, for example, a patient who is low income and housebound and having difficult, like, cannot access. Uh, those typical outpatient services like blood work, for example, um, are there any um, programs or solutions being explored to help meet the needs of those types of patients? Another example she mentioned is around inclusive services um, for patients who are disabled or perhaps autistic and have sensory needs. Um, are, what are what are the mechanisms that may be in place in the family care team model to assist those patients? And just generally uh, inclusivity and accessibility with this new family care team model. Yeah, so I can take that one a little bit from the, the Eastern urban perspective. Uh, we do have circumstances where the interdisciplinary team and primary care providers, they do visit homes if people are homebound and they're unable to, uh, to travel to clinics if that is required. There are also a couple of changes that we've made within the family care team for those who really have difficulty, um, you know, making appointments or transportation issues that, um, make it difficult to attend uh, appointments at multiple different facilities. We will bring some of those services on site, for example, uh, blood work that she referenced, Angie references there. So we, we certainly make accommodations. We have had, just as a, a, a personal example, an individual who had a diagnosis of autism who um, gave us some feedback about the stimulation even in the, the waiting area. So for that individual, we uh, booked their appointments later in the day. We actually had the lights dim the TV turned off when that happened. So we, we certainly respond to individual needs if that those are brought forward to us. 
I'll just add before Erica jumps in that was part of Angie's question that I maybe didn't address. Where do patients go to connect with management if their needs are not being met? Um, so, presumably, uh, whoever they're interacting with in the clinic will be able to help them address some of that if they are uh, were to bring some concerns forward. Yes, you're absolutely right, Melissa. And so we, we also always have uh, the client relations line, but we do ask if there's any uh, issues that you are feeling that need to be brought forward that you first address that at the management level. And then if you don't feel as though your needs are being met, we do have client relations information available on the internet as well as by phone if you prefer to reach out that way. Go ahead, Erica. Uh, yeah, I, I thought this would be a good time as well to just uh, reiterate that, you know, the family care teams are about bringing um, a collaborative approach to care and, and shared care with a variety of different providers. But we also need to remember that part of our family care team approach is partnering with existing services and programs. So the community support program, as an example, do offer support to non-ambulatory or clients that have mobility challenges, can't get out of their home uh, to address some needs. And, and we would work with these community partners, same with mental health and addiction services, uh, provincial autism services, and so on. So it's not about creating all the resources within the team. The team, part of the team is actually partnering and strengthening connections with pre-existing services to ensure that we are meeting the needs of the population. Yeah, that's a good point, Erica. Um, Monica and Bernadette. Uh, Cheryl, I thought this might be a good uh, place to also uh, let folks know that <clears throat> as part of the governance structure I mentioned earlier on, you know, there'll be a provincial steering committee, a strategic health network, but for each of these 35 teams, there will be a local leadership uh, committee as well, and that will have team members, team leadership, but also stakeholders from the community as part of it. So these teams, again, uh, we want to emphasize, are intended to be responsive to local needs, and uh, that teams will be responsive and flexible and creative in working with uh, families and communities and coming up with solutions uh, to unique uh, local issues and challenges and needs. So. Um, there'll be opportunity for uh, patients and their families and community leaders as well to have input into how these teams uh, are designed initially and how they will need to evolve over time. So again, I just want to emphasize that flexibility and responsiveness. Uh, it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's about uh, you know working together to figure out what's happening in your community and what you need to do at a service level to respond to local needs. Thanks, Monica. Erin, did you want to add something? I did, yeah. To build on Erica's points there, absolutely. It's engagement with those other programs that exist. And just to say, because there was a question around virtual care, and we certainly embrace virtual care within the family care team model as well. So for those uh, homebound clients, we often use either video or by phone. Uh, we have a number of different appointments. I think we're actually maybe upwards of 30% of all of our primary care providers, so nurse practitioner, our family doctor appointments are done virtually. So we certainly, uh, uh, you know, we are flexible to meet the needs of the clients and we lean into virtual care. And I know that Erica has even more initiatives underway about uh, connecting to virtual care providers in the in the Western zone, which I won't take credit for. Um, so she can speak to that if, if that's of interest to everyone. But we're certainly trying to leverage all the existing resources, whether they be, you know, on the ground, like community support program or the ones that we can connect with virtually. Great. Thanks, Erin. Um, Will, Bernadette, maybe you can answer this one for us. Will everyone in the province be assigned a family care team? Or if someone already has a primary care provider, can they choose to stay with their current primary care provider? Can you speak to us about that a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Uh, patients can remain with their existing primary care provider and still have access to the multidisciplinary team. Uh, part of the innovation of family care teams is the opportunity for community practices to affiliate 
um, with a, their local family care team so that their patients can receive support and care from the full team as needed and appropriate. And even if their primary care provider does not formally affiliate with the team, patients will still have access to services in their area. I guess it's important to note that to date, um, patients without a primary care provider have been a top priority for family care teams and will remain so as patients continue to identify themselves um, through registration on Patient Connect NL. Yeah, thanks, Bernadette. Yes, that certainly makes sense that patients, people without a primary care provider right now would be a priority for access to family care teams. Um, we've touched on this a little bit already about um, connection to the community and community engagement. Um, Erica, can you talk to us about that a little bit more, um, like how and why family care teams would engage with people in the communities? Absolutely. You know, we, we understand the importance of engaging clients and communities in our system design. And when you think about it, who better understands local needs and what assets are within a community and strengths to build on than the people actually living in the community. So absolutely, there is a focus on engaging clients and their communities. So we have several different ways that we engage. Uh, one of the ways is through our community advisory committees. And on these committees, we would have client advisors and partner advisors. And these committees are at various stages of development across the province. So um, keep your eyes and ears open for information on your local community advisory committee. That is one way that we help to identify the needs in the area, provide feedback on policy, help to design programs and services, and also ways to uh, identify how a community wants to be communicated with, so increasing that, that awareness. Other ways that we engage uh, the community and gather feedback is through our community health assessment process. So that consists of community surveys, uh, focus groups, and, and partner interviews if needed to gather additional information, and very much a focus on identifying local strengths, concerns, and opportunities for improvement. We also conduct broad community engagement sessions, a town hall sessions, they may look different depending on the community and, and how they uh, feel it is best to engage uh, with a focus on gathering information around co-design or opportunities for service integration. And additionally, we seek feedback through our client advisors. Um, Client advisors would be a user of a particular service, someone with experience and a particular need. And uh, we may have client advisors sit on various committees or working groups to support the development of new initiatives, establish processes, uh, evaluate current processes. So engaging the voice of the client and their families are, are very important uh, when doing that. So one example uh, in the Western Zone we have a client advisor on our virtual care working group. And uh, our client advisors would help to identify our key focus areas, how we message things to the broader community, our workflow processes with virtual care. How do we make virtual care um, less intimidating if you don't have experience with it? How do we ensure that we're getting the most out of our virtual care experience? So very active engagement from our clients who use our virtual care services. And lastly, there's a focus on strengthening partnerships and linkages with high risk or underserved patient populations to ensure that we are considering their voice and their needs. We want to be as inclusive and equitable as possible in our approach and our service design. And I think we talked about you know, some examples already so we are often seeking representation on our community advisory committees or other groups, as I mentioned, to ensure that that voice is represented. Excellent, thank you, Erica. Um, yeah, that's a significant amount of community engagement. Um, thank you. And Melissa, what other questions do we have from our audience? 
Yeah, I was just uh, reading one here. Um, one of our audience members was um, wanted to clarify. He said, just so I'm clear, family care teams won't include specialists such as urologists or respirologists or other physicians of the, uh, that are considered specialists, correct? Um, can you just maybe talk a little bit about would the process be any different if you end up needing a referral to a specialist? I've seen a family care team versus seen a, um, a general practitioner. Yeah, I can, I can certainly take that one. So you're correct. There are no special services that are working under the roof, we'll say, of a, a family care team as it is in its current iteration. And from a referral process, uh, Melissa, your follow-up question there, the, the process would be the same, right? We want to certainly house as many services as possible within the family care team, but if there is a necessity for a specialist referral, it would undergo the same process, just like a lot of community uh, physicians that are currently practicing, they would complete a referral, it would go on to the specialist's office, and then you would be contacted for further follow-up. Thanks, Erin. Um, I'm reading another question here. There's some uh, some great questions about uh, kind of specific examples of how things work under this new model of family care teams. Um, so someone asks, is there a process where social workers with um, the Department of Children, Seniors and Social Development can make connections on behalf of a client who's in receipt of income support or client who may not have access to a family doctor and doesn't know how to navigate um, some of the technology or communication mechanisms that might be available. They often rely on a social worker to help them navigate that area. Um, so they, they're they wondering, you know, is there a process that will help family care teams connect with, um, let's say, social workers in the Department of Children, Seniors, and Social Development? Yeah, I can speak from an operational perspective that we do have social navigators as they're described within the Health Accord NL that are embedded within the family care teams. Of course, we're all in different stages of recruitment right across the province, but in some sites, we already have these positions uh, in place and executed. They'll do exactly what was described, really. They help individuals as well as their advocates or uh, their guardians to assist with the navigation of some of the complex systems that we have in place. You know, I wasn't around the table like Cheryl and Monica while hearing this feedback when the Health Accord NL was, um, you know, going through the consultation process, but the recommendations were to embed social navigators as well as clinical care navigators because of the complex systems that we do have, whether that might be uh, income support or uh, seeking housing through Newfoundland Labrador Housing Corporation. And social navigators do exactly that, not only help navigate those systems, but then also put, point you in the right direction with mental health and addiction supports or uh, access to any of the other uh, programs that we have within NL Health Services and also our community partners. So there's a number of community agencies. Uh, the Autism Society was referenced earlier here that do really excellent work uh, and just there's a number of services out there but I think through the health accord consultations heard loud and clear that it's very difficult to find these resources and navigate to them so we have dedicated resources within the family care teams that will assist with that great thanks um so not only do we have, you know, members of the public on our session today, but also some uh, healthcare providers from different fields as well. Um, so someone is curious about um, the structure of payments for healthcare providers in the family care team model. Um, is it a fee for service model or value based contracts? Um, how, how does that work with when you have different providers coming from different areas? of the health and social care system working together in under one technical, uh, technically under one roof or virtually under one roof on, as part of a family care team. I can uh, start to answer that one, Cheryl. Um, certainly with our family care teams, uh, there will be a core group of health care providers that would be employees of Newfoundland Labrador Health Services and that, that could include the variety of, of health professionals. 
professionals. So we'll have salaried um, individuals um, who are employed according to their, you know, the contracts for that particular uh, union or profession. Uh, but I will also comment here that, uh, and we referenced it earlier, uh, partnering with uh, community providers. And to start with, uh, in particular with family physicians, we have, in collaboration with the Medical Association, uh, developed a process for affiliation with family care teams, whereby um, a family physician who's not a salary provider, and in the province right now, I, I won't go into detail on this, but there are two other options. There's a fee-for-service model or a new payment model that's coming into play, which is called the blended capitation model. There will be opportunities for those physicians to maintain their own autonomous practice uh, while affiliating with a family care team. So we've started with you know, the development of an official process for family physicians, but we anticipate over time that we will also be looking at processes for affiliation with, for example, community-based pharmacies. Uh, someone mentioned earlier dental practices, physiotherapists, uh, you know, opt optometry might be another one. So again, depending on, on the needs of the area, um, you know, there'll be creative uh, solutions and discussions with how those partnerships, uh, you know, can, what they can look like. But in terms of payment models right now, I would say it would be the salary providers. And in the case of physicians, uh, the affiliation for those alternate payment models that I referenced. Thanks, Monica. Melissa, are there any other questions? Sure. Um, I'm not sure if anybody on the call is uh, available to or able to answer this question right now, but um, someone is curious about how long the wait list is to be assigned to a family care team, which is, of course, very, very much a concern for anybody who's connected through Patient Connect and is is looking to have a primary care provider assigned to them. Um, is there uh, any indication of how long that wait might be? Go ahead, Erica. I, I think that is a very difficult question to answer. And the reason it's difficult to answer is because it varies so broadly across the province. So all teams are in various stages of um, building, they have, uh, you know, certain amount of vacancies or positions filled. So the wait time for attachment um, is different depending on the team you are looking to be attached to. Primarily is probably the one closest to where you live. Um, what I would say is that the there are several services available to support you while you are waiting to be attached. And there is an acknowledgement that the needs of all people in the province are very important to consider and, and the unattached person uh, definitely needs an access point. So right now within our province, there, is, there are uh, virtual primary health care services, there are walk-in services available, and, and this will vary depending on where you live, what zone you're in, and so on. Um, and there are um, open appointments available at, you know, through some family care teams as well. So um, I, I think I, I can't give you a number. Um, I think it's very specific to the area and the team, but we do appreciate that the wait times are long um, within the Western zone. Um, I can say that, you know, there have been people waiting for a significant amount of time to be attached upwards of two years or something. But what I can also say is that, you know, we are attaching, so um, hopefully the wait won't be much longer. Probably a good opportunity as well to encourage people, if you haven't already and you do not have a primary care provider, to register on Patient Connect. 
because that's how we identify those who would be eligible for the virtual care services offered through Teladoc. So just feel as though we, we shouldn't allow this entire session to go by without uh, referencing Patient Connect NL. Uh, there's a website as well as a telephone number to call where you can identify yourself as not having a primary care provider or you're aware that your primary care provider is leaving or retiring and you can then put your, your hand up to say that you are in need of, of attachment to a physician or a nurse practitioner, and in the meantime, you will also have access to the virtual care through Teladoc. Cheryl, if I could just add to what Erin has said as well, uh, we are monitoring at the department um, all uh, registrations to Patient Connect, so we can see the picture across the entire province, uh, what the numbers are looking like, which in, within each of these uh, 35 geographical areas. So um, that information when people register also helps us from a planning perspective in terms of, you know, if we need to zone in on a particular area where, uh, you know, there's a concerning number of, of registrations. And, uh, and as um, Aaron has said, uh, obviously, uh, even if there's a small number in a certain location, we want to emphasize that there are options available as well, like the Teladoc and 811 as well, we'll put out there is always a great resource as well for folks. And Bernadette, I think, has something to add as well. Yeah, I can just also add that even just taking a snapshot, if we look at patients um, connecting to family care teams, even since May of last year, we've seen over a 60% increase in patients getting connected to family care teams. So we're uh, moving in the right direction um, and, uh, you know, happy that uh, we can, you know, share that as well. That's great, thank you. Melissa, I, I see that we've got about two minutes left. Um, maybe time for one more question? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I might squeeze in two here because one question, and I think it probably goes hand in hand with what you guys just mentioned about Patient Connect. Um, someone is wondering, um, for example, seniors in the province who may not be super familiar with accessing things technology uh, through technology or virtually or even getting on the Internet to find out some information. Is there a phone number that someone could call where they could just generally find out some information, whether it's about patient connect or family care teams or what to do if they don't have a family doctor and let's say they need a prescription filled or something like that? What would be the go to? Place. Is that 811 or is there a different number that people should call? Oh, I think you're on me. Go ahead, Bernard. Um, I, I think depending on the information that that's being sought, there could be different resources. We would certainly like if anyone has an immediate health care need and they are not able to get in touch with, you know, uh, their own family doctor or, you know, it, it's immediate and it's not an emergent need where you would obviously go to the nearest emergency department. We always promote 811 as a resource and 811 can provide that health care advice and navigation. Uh, I would also uh, put a plug in here as well for uh, community pharmacies as well, who uh, now have uh, enhanced abilities to extend prescriptions and treat uh, more conditions and ailments than in the past. So local pharmacists, if someone's run out of a prescription, or even if they have one of the conditions that a pharmacist is able to assess and prescribe, that's another, another resource. I think what we need to do is get the patient connect um, link in here because on patient connect there is a list of uh, options for access uh, and numbers and so on so um, uh, we could get that posted in here for folks but if someone's not able to register for patient connect themselves um, there is a phone number bernadette is saying here now and we don't, yes, I don't I have think I just, front of us. <laughs> I think I, I think I might have just stumbled across it myself. Um, you can register for Patient Connect online at the website that I did put in the chat a few minutes ago. Or if you don't have access to online registration, it says please, please call this 1-800 number that I'm going to put in the chat as well. Yeah. 
Yeah, I would also say for seniors that seniors NL is an extremely valuable resource where they have a lot of uh, uh, summaries, I would say, of programs that are available, some internal to NLA or Newfoundland Library Health Services, others external. And so that's always an avenue if there's challenges navigating any of the online platforms. I think that they would be uh, an excellent place to start. Yeah, that's a good good point as well. Um, recognizing that we have only well, we're a little bit out of time. Um, I, one question that one last question that I'm going to squeeze in here. Um, just um, wondering if anybody on the call has any thoughts about um, whether or not you see this model of family care teams potentially replacing the typical family doctor model that we're so used to here in Newfoundland and Labrador in the future, or if you see it as working kind of hand in hand. I'll start to respond by that to that one. Certainly in our policy framework, we've emphasized throughout our policy framework for family care teams that family care teams will build on the existing primary health care structure and strengths in our communities, and that includes without a doubt existing uh, family practices. And um, and I mentioned at the beginning that, you know, every one of these family care teams will be based on a needs assessment of not only what are the health care needs of a particular area, but also what are the resources and the potential partnerships that can be established to create these teams. So I would definitely say these are not in any way intended to replace it's meant to enhance, and there will be opportunities, as I mentioned earlier, for existing family practices in particular to, to affiliate with, uh, with family care teams. And even if um, you know, family practices don't go through that formal affiliation process, there will be processes in place where their patients may still be able to access some of the interdisciplinary team members of the family care team in their particular geographical area. So definitely we're building on a strong foundation of uh, community health services that we have here in the province. Yeah, I'd just like to take the opportunity to echo Monica's uh, sentiments there that really we see this as a partnership, knowing that within the family care teams, we are able to get connected to a smaller number of individuals, while the large majority of those will still remain connected to physicians that are out in the community. We are starting to have the conversations now about co-design of service, identifying what the needs would be of particular geographies, getting the feedback of community physicians to say, how can we help you in your practice? How can we, uh, how can we impact the health of those that you serve and treat? And so those conversations are starting now. Uh, we had uh, a large focus on access to those who were unattached at the beginning of the family care team policy framework rollout. And now we're really opening the door to those conversations conversations with community uh, physicians to start co-designing what services would look like to support those who are connected to those clinics. Thank you all. This has been a really great discussion about family care teams and I hope answered some people's questions about um, the rollout and implementation um, and how what it's going to look like for those without a uh, primary care provider right now once they become attached to a family care team. So we have gone a couple minutes over, but nothing, nothing um, major. Um, so I want to thank uh, you, Monica, Bernadette, Aaron, Erica, and Cheryl for leading us through this really good discussion on a very important topic. Um, and a big thank you to everyone who joined us online to listen and participate in our discussion. I uh, just want to remind you that the recording of this session will be up on our YouTube channel in the coming days, and you can check out the recordings of all the previous sessions there as well. And I'm just going to share this quickly on the screen that coming up um, on April 30th, our next session is going to focus on the topic of social prescribing. And we have guests from the Canadian Institute for Social Prescribing, Seniors NL, and Memorial University. So registration is open for that one now. Um, and lastly, you're going to see a very short post-event survey on your screen after we end the webinar. We'd appreciate it if you have any uh, feedback or share any ideas for future healthy discussions with us via that survey. So thank you again, everybody.
Bernadette, did you have something you wanted to add there? Oh, so sorry. I just wanted to mention the Healthcare Action um, website. It gives updates on, because I know yeah. some of the questions are there on where are the teams and the progress. So um, the Healthcare Action website um, will be updated shortly and let people know where the teams are. Perfect. That's great to know. Thank you again to everybody who joined us online today and uh, have a great rest of your afternoon.